Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this one Gloucestershire engagement hearing today, the 24th of October. Um, this hearing has been agreed uh, or set up effectively as an opportunity for people to come and talk to and uh, express their views about what um, the health bodies concerned should be thinking about with regards to the one Gloucestershire programme and the different uh, improvements that they're looking to make for the communities across Gloucestershire. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to start by introducing everybody who's here on the panel. Um, my name's Nicholas Duffin. I'm an independent chair. I'm a fellow of the Consultation Institute. And my job today is to um, chair the event, make sure everybody talks about what they wish to, um, answers questions, we have a good discussion, um, and the information that is acquired is useful information for the process that one Gloucestershire is going through. Um, I'm going to let my panel members uh, introduce themselves. If I could start with Will. Um, I'm Will Miles. I'm a GP in Cheltenham at the Portland GP practice. Um, I'm also a CCG board member. Um, and just to confirm potential conflicts of interest, I do own a share of my GP premises along with my GP partners. Um, and my wife also uh, owns a share in those premises. I'm Joe. Hi, I am Amjad Opal. I'm a general adult psychiatrist and medical director in Gloucestershire Health and Care NHS Foundation Trust. Good morning, I'm Simon Lansley. I'm director of strategy at Gloucestershire Hospitals Trust. Good morning, I'm Julie Clapworthy. I'm the independent nurse at Gloucestershire Clinical Commissioning Group and I'm a standing member of CUSAC 2 at NICE, the National Institute of Care and Health Excellence. Good morning, I'm Mark Biotroni. I'm a consultant acute physician and also medical director and director for safety at uh, the Acute Trust. My wife is a GP in Gloucester City. Okay, Caroline? I'm Caroline Bennett. I'm um, a GP at Borton and North Leach Surgeries in the North Cotswolds. Um, I'm also a member of the um, CCG. I'm one of the GP board members. And my husband is a consultant anaesthetist at Gloucestershire Hospitals Trust and also works in private practice. Sorry, you. Morning. Um, I am the current uh, Divisional Director of Quality and Nursing for Medicine and also the Specialty Director of Cardiology and Respiratory Services. Rob. Good morning. I'm Rob Stacey. I'm an emergency medicine consultant and I work at both hospitals in the emergency departments. Uh, and my wife, similarly, is an emergency medicine consultant at the two hospitals. Cathy. Good morning. I'm Cathy Campbell. I'm service director for urgent care in Gloucester Health and Care, NHS Foundation Trust. Maria. Hello, my name is Maria Bedraw. I am the senior nurse for urgent emergency care in Gloucestershire Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, and thank you for inviting me. A bit like University Challenge, isn't it, really, going around there about that? Um, so just to explain a little bit further about the process today, um, we will have a range of guests who will be coming to present us with information that they want us to consider, uh, or my panel members to consider. Obviously, it's not my job to do so, but th they'll be coming in to actually present what they want to have considered as part of this process. Um, and that can come in many shapes and forms, uh, information-wise. Um, the panel here will listen. Um, they will ask questions about what they hear and, and, and get ask questions about for clarity of different things that people say and have an element of discussion about the ideas as well. Um, on our agenda today, we have um, a written submission by Suicide Crisis, which I'm going to come to in a second. We'll be hearing from Councillor Richard Stanley of Tewkesbury Borough Council. Um, we will then be taking a break at around about 12.30. Um, we'll hear from Councillor Flo uh, Klukas this afternoon, uh, Professor Robert Arnott, uh, Tony Foster, who's a Cheltenham resident, um, the organisation REACH, and John Thurston of the Friends of Lydney Hospital. That is our agenda as it stands. Um, there may be gaps between people speaking, depending on, we allocate 45 minutes time per person, and there may be some gaps going along as we move along. Um, it is an opportunity for those who are watching online, if they wish to, to um, submit questions, you can find the details on our web if they wish to do so. I can't guarantee there'll be an opportunity to answer them, and likewise with the audience here, if there's anything that, if we get a gap and they want to um, ask something, then I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can create an opportunity for you to actually do so. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is because unfortunately our representative from Suicide Crisis was not able to come today, was unwell, um, they have actually sent us a written statement. Um, and Becky Parrish um, is going to read that on behalf of them, and then we're going to briefly discuss. 
Becky, if I can hand that over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's quite loud, isn't it? Is that OK? <laughs> yeah. OK, so this um, has been sent to us by um, a, a representative of Suicide Crisis. We've got permission from them to read this out unredacted, and it will also be forming part of the engagement report that we're preparing. Um, bear with me, it's, it's two sides of A4. So the, um, the heading is Developing Urgent and Hospital Care in Gloucestershire Engagement. I write in response to your request to involve us in the engagement process, in brackets, Developing Urgent and Emergency Hospital Care in Gloucestershire. I am writing on behalf of the charity Suicide Crisis, a charity which provides two suicide crisis centres in Cheltenham and a trauma centre. We have been providing these services since 2013. We provide a county-wide service as we also go out to people in crisis, either in their homes or in other appropriate venues. My comments below relate to our concerns about the potential loss of Cheltenham General Hospital's A&E department. I hope to demonstrate that this may lead to a risk of loss of lives. Although we provide essential crisis support to people who are in suicidal crisis, there are times when it is, when it is clear that the person is not just in suicidal crisis, but may be very mentally unwell too. At such times, we have a responsibility to ensure that they are assessed by a psychiatric clinician. We have an advising psychiatrist working within our charity, but he only works in an advisory capacity to our team. He does not work directly with our clients. If we contact the Together NHS Foundation Trust Mental Health Crisis Team in relation to a client, they may refuse to take the referral. The crisis team has often said to us that unless the person consents to being contacted by the crisis team, they will not contact the person. The crisis team will often require specific consent from the person. And in any case, the fastest route to a mental health assessment is via accident and emergency. The psychiatric liaison team is accessible 24 hours at the hospitals. It is widely and quite rightly stated that a person at imminent risk of suicide should go to an A&E department. I myself walked into Cheltenham A&E when I had a strong intent to end my life a few years ago. That led to an assessment by one of the mental health liaison team nurses who recommended that I was immediately admitted to psychiatric hospital. If Cheltenham A&E had not existed, I might not be allowed, alive today. I was able to walk to Cheltenham A&E. That simply required putting one foot in front of the other. It was a 20 minute walk and I knew the route to Cheltenham A&E well. I had been a volunteer at the hospital in the past. However, I would not have been able to navigate the more complex journey to Gloucester A&E. That would have required a degree of forward planning about buses, travel and how to get there. I don't drive. The thought of a longer complex journey and having to be around people on buses while so mentally unwell, I simply would not have been able to do it. Recently, I stayed on the phone to a client as she walked to Cheltenham A&E during the daytime. When she called us that day, it was clear that she was at an outdoor location where she was unsafe. Her presentation was very different from usual. I was concerned that she needed a mental health assessment with a psychiatrist. I encouraged her to go to A&E, keeping me on the phone all the time. And because she had built a strong trust with our organisation, she did as I asked. I could not have done the same to get her to Gloucester, requiring her to take more than one bus journey. It was the simplicity of the journey, just one foot in front of the other, which made it possible for her, just as it did for me in the past. Having a minor injuries unit makes a difference to patients who are in mental health crisis or in suicidal crisis. We have heard of people being turned away from the Cheltenham Minor Injuries Unit at night if they are feeling suicidal. Some clients coming to us have reported that, that happening. They have been told, this is not an appropriate place for you, you need to go to Gloucester A&E department. As my previous paragraphs have explained, for many patients, the effort and complexity of the journey over to Gloucester is not possible at that point. They simply walk out of Cheltenham A&E at a point where they are at risk of suicide. I have not heard of these patients being transported to Gloucester A&E by ambulance. They are left to make their own arrangements and are <coughs> unlikely to be able to do so. I believe that the closure of Cheltenham A&E will create a risk to life for some people who are in suicidal crisis. 
I hope that matters as much to Gloucestershire hospital bosses as it matters to us. We also have to look at the capacity of Gloucester Royal Hospital to be able to cope with the additional numbers of patients which Cheltenham A&E sees during the daytime. I accompanied a Gloucester-based client to Gloucester A&E department last month. We were taken by ambulance because he was presenting as though he was having a seizure. At Gloucester A&E, he was lined up in the corridor with other patients, all of them on trolleys. Gloucester A&E was clearly struggling to cope with the numbers of the day in the daytime. I asked one of the paramedics if it was usual for patients to be lined up on trolleys in the corridor in the daytime, and he said it was. I was shocked to hear this. We strongly urge hospital bosses not to close Cheltenham A&E. I believe that there is a real and continuing risk that they will because they have only made a commitment to having urgent care in Cheltenham Hospital. And urgent care can mean a minor injuries unit, not an accident and emergency department. And it's signed Joy Hibbins, founder and CEO of Suicide Crisis. Okay, um, so a quite heartfelt um, uh, statement there. Um, and Jan, I just wondered if you, uh, I don't know if you wanted to lead on, on this, and just, is there anything there that you would particularly want to look at? Um, I don't think that there was anything in particular. I, I think we, uh, I mean, both the any &E departments are staffed. Uh, I mean, we provide support through the mental health liaison team. Um, and, uh, I mean, the point about um, accepting referrals, yes, ideally we would like patients to have consented, but there are instances where if the situation is very acute, mm. then we will accept referrals uh, when they are not consented, if, if that is not possible. Okay. Um, well, as a GP, any thoughts on what she said there? Um, I, I would like to sort of ask a bit around the um, idea that uh, the right thing to do for a person at imminent risk of suicide would be to go direct to an A&E department. Um, I appreciate there may potentially be some rare situations where that's the case, but I I'm not sure that would be the normal route for a, a patient who is feeling uh, depressed and suicidal. Um, normally one would expect them to be contacting their GP or out of hours service um, <coughs> uh, and th th therefore be helped to, to find the right help that way rather than having to go directly to an A&E department. Mm. I wondered that. There's the statement isn't there that says the fastest route to a mental health assessment is via A&E. Whether that's fact or perception, we need to consider that, don't we, in whatever yeah. solutions we consider. Okay. I'd also also like to sort of mention as well the rural GPs on the, um, on the on the panel that sort of the, the equality say if this person had presented in the North Cotswolds, um, mm -hmm. any ideas perhaps they might have as to how um, it might have been approached differently. Okay. Any other comments? Anything else there? And only just for us to consider the skill set of the person to whom they present. Mm. Um, uh, there may well be a need for a specialist consultant psychiatrist, but when somebody is in crisis, and indeed that does matter to us, um, who is it and, and what skill set do they want to meet when they're at that point to then navigate care? Because mm. that might be general practice, it might be an experienced nurse in a department who can assess risk and signpost other services, or it might be somebody who can directly link through to psychiatric services if that's necessary and how can we provide that where people need it yeah. and I think uh, I mean people can self-refer to the crisis teams as well so they will respond within four hours or okay. I mean, as soon as possible I mean it occurs to me that the, the the statement focuses on experiences and scenarios as opposed to solutions as such or any particular proposal for things that they want considered as a solution um, is it worth um, inviting, uh, you know, suicide crisis to, to, to talk or present something that they want? Um, obviously can't do it now because they're not here, but present what they think should be the solutions that should be being considered um, to what they perceive to be problems? Yeah. Um, yeah? yeah I think that that's something that would be better done, obviously, away from... We can't really do, deal with that now because, obviously, they're not here. And we, otherwise, we might have a discussion about it. But, but, but worth somebody contacting them with that in mind? Yeah. Yes, and I think there's a number of questions that come up from this statement 
Uh, so, no, it's an independent. I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. I'm not sure I know what the cover is at Cheltenham at night for mental health patients. And if, you know, so I think there are a number of strands to this that they've presented mm. that I'm not sure we have enough information about. Okay, all right. So, I, um, yeah. I, I mean, look, it's obviously a very, very powerful statement. Mm. It seems to me that the, the key issue that comes out of it is access to advice. 24-7 appropriately, and we've already talked about a number of different uh, places where advice can be received, which makes it clear that it's complex. Yeah. And, you know, A&E, the lights are on, and people know if you turn up, and then someone will will help you. So that there's perhaps something to explore with um, suicide crisis and other mm. stakeholders in, in this area, what an access to advice 24-7 that is simply... Uh, communicated well might look like. Because mm. um, as we've said, or as Robin particular <coughs> said, A&E may not be the best place for this mm. kind of mm. person. But we do need to make sure that this kind of person knows where to go for advice when they're in this kind of situation, or the carer who's, who's, who's looking after the person. I mean, it, it, it struck me, I mean, obviously I'm not from a medical background or anything, but, but um, it, 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 what I saw, what I read into it to some degree was the fact that once again, people who might have a better entry to the system are still thinking about A&E as the entry point, mm -hmm. which is something that we see recurring for lots of different scenarios, um, and how effectively that is managed in, I, I, to make systems more efficient. And I appreciate that's part of what one place is looking at at the moment anyway. Um, so hopefully that will be borne in mind. But do, do you think we can leave it, Becky, that we'll, we'll contact them to uh, have some further input as to what they, they think should be put forward for solutions? Okay, all right. I don't know if there's anything else anybody else wants to say on that before we close off and more co move on to talking to uh, Councillor Richard uh, Stanley.